Hello again and welcome to yet another installment of the famous and exciting Neurological Complications of Systemic Disease. And the topic for this discussion is going to be the complications of sepsis. Typically, neurologists will be consulted at three different times throughout the course of someone's sepsis illness, the first of which is acutely when they're encephalopathic. Later on, when they're attempting to wean the ventilator, there may be some issues with neuromuscular weakness. And then finally, once the sepsis has resolved, there may be some residual encephalopathy which requires further neurological evaluation. So in the period of an acute sepsis, typically there will be an alteration in cognition or level of consciousness. And at that point, there is a concern whether there are other treatable or reversible entities contributing to that altered mental status. So it's the function of the neurologist usually to perform a very detailed examination looking for any evidence of focality, and if present, that would indicate an imaging study to rule out a structural lesion. Other considerations are most notably various medications, and in particular, opiates and benzodiazepines uh, traditionally reduce someone's um, ability to react to the environment. Other considerations are whether the patient was taking an SSRI while at home and perhaps given fentanyl or other medications which can contribute to a um, serotonin syndrome. And there are antibiotics that can also cause altered mental status, most notably cefepime and other beta-lactam antibiotics particularly in the face of renal insufficiency and high doses of the antibiotics can induce an encephalopathy characterized by altered mental status, perhaps myoclonus, and leading even to seizures. Of course, organ failure such as renal insufficiency or hepatic insufficiency related to shock liver in which one sees an elevation of transaminases in which you may not necessarily see an increase in ammonia levels, can also contribute significantly to the encephalopathy at this time. Frequently, when a patient with sepsis begins the resolution phase, in which they're more alert and interactive, and the lab values are normalizing, there are attempts to wean people off of the ventilator, at that time, patients may demonstrate um, some difficulty with breathing with tachypnea or some paradoxical breathing or use of accessory breathing muscles and the uh, possibility of a neuromuscular disorder is entertained. Uh, very commonly, those weaknesses are evidence of an ICU-acquired weakness most likely related to what's termed either critical illness polyneuropathy or critical illness myopathy. They frequently occur together and so it's sometimes really almost academic to distinguish one from the other. The risk factors for patients who tend to develop this complication is the duration of the sepsis and immobility and the number of organ systems that were involved. Previously, it had been thought that steroid uses, usage and or uh, the use of paralytics were a risk factor, but that's more recently been questioned. So the diagnosis is made uh, based on the history and neuromuscular studies, which tend to show distal axonal motor neuropathies, plus or minus myopathic changes. However, we always have to keep in mind that there are other conditions such as spinal cord shock, which can present similarly, and that might be due to either an epidural infection or hematoma or even a metastatic lesion, or even the more rare neuromuscular disorder with either ALS 
or myasthenia gravis playing a role. And finally, neurologists may be consulted when the patient isn't returning to their baseline or normal mental status when it's thought that it would be appropriate for them to do so. That's extremely age-dependent. And in young persons who get septic, usually within seven days, their mentation begins to return to its baseline state. However, the prognosis for recovery in uh, sepsis encephalopathy is very dependent upon the severity of the encephalopathy and whether or not there was any pre-existing cognitive disturbances so that in older persons, when the lab values normalize, sometimes it may take up to weeks afterwards before their cognition returns to its normal state. However, if uh, that does not occur, then considerations would include various conditions such as non-convulsive status epilepticus in which there are seizures electronically in the brain that aren't manifest peripherally, or there is a CNS seeding from the original sepsis so that a spinal tap may be indicated. And finally, various uh, either ischemic or hemorrhagic strokes can take place. A lot of times patients go into atrial fibrillation and may have emboli causing ischemic strokes or may, they may have developed a coagulopathy and have hemorrhagic ones. So a CT scan would be adequate to look for hemorrhagic strokes, but an MRI scan would be the um, procedure of choice to look for ischemic. Now sharpen your brain for a little quiz.